about a uh, hundred miles east of the coast of Asia Minor, in present-day Turkey, there was a group of three cities, Colossae, Laodicea, and Hierapolis. All of them were located within a few miles of each other. And within each of those cities, there was a group of believers, a church, a church that met to worship Jesus Christ. In around 60, 62 AD, when the Apostle Paul was in a Roman prison, he wrote a letter to one of those churches, the church in Colossae. And though he had never met them, though he had never been there, he expressed his concern for them. And he said for the believers in Laodicea. Colossians 2, 1, he said that in his heart and in his mind, he struggled over them. He agonized for them. In verse 8 of the same chapter, he said, why? He warned them. He said, be on guard. Be alert. He said, be careful. There's a danger there. And you may not even know the danger exists. He says, there are those who would carry you away. Just like they were carrying away a captive in a war. And they're carrying you away by the wisdom of men. And they call it the wisdom of God. He warned them, don't allow yourselves to be kidnapped and dragged back into the slavery of the thinking of the world. Colossians 4.16 He told the church in Colossae to share this information, to share this warning with the church in Laodicea. That church should have listened to the warning. Because by the time Christ wrote to this church here in Revelation chapter 3 some 35 years later a lot had changed in Laodicea. They had not impacted the city. The city had impacted them. Laodicea was a a city that was founded in 253 B.C. by a Syrian ruler named Antiochus II. He named the city after his wife Laodicea. That was a nice gesture. But I guess it didn't help their marriage much because they were divorced. They later got back together, so then she poisoned them and killed them. Like I said, I guess it didn't help the marriage much. Aside from a questionable beginning, by the world standards, the city of Laodicea had a lot going for it. A major road began in the eastern port city of Ephesus. It went right through Laodicea, into the interior, west, into Asia Minor. There was a road that went from north to south, from Pergamum through Laodicea, all the way to the Mediterranean. This was an ideal location for commercial trade and commerce. A great place to start a business. And Laodicea became a city of finance. It became a city for all kinds of financial transactions. People could bring letters of credit to the banks in Laodicea, and they could get cash. They could exchange it for cash. The bankers in Laodicea were very accommodating. They had gotten a reputation that they were easy to do business with. And so as a result, the people in the city became rich. Laodicea was a city of industry. It was a manufacturing center for textiles, for high-quality clothing, tunics, carpets. Like today, it was all about the brand name. Like designer jeans. If the label said, made in Laodicea, it was highly valued. Their clothing was in demand. They couldn't keep it on their shelves. But they were particularly proud of a soft, black, glossy wool. That was only produced in their cities. They wove it into garments, into carpets. They shipped it all over the known world. You know, even today, that wool can't be duplicated. The city of Laodicea became famous. They had a medical school. Physicians came from all over to study there. This school developed all kinds of mixtures. They were used to cure all kinds of diseases. They apparently had some success because eye problems were extremely common in that part of the world at that time and the doctors there had developed a powder that could be used to effectively treat eye infections and eye diseases. By the world standard, this was a very successful city. 
It was a wealthy city. It was so wealthy that when their city was destroyed in 60 AD by an earthquake, they refused help from the Roman government to rebuild their city. They rebuilt it all by themselves. They had the money to do it. Their biggest problem wasn't money. It was water. They had none. They didn't have a good water supply. But that didn't stop them. They had the money to fix that problem too. So they built an underground water system consisting of stone pipes, an aqueduct that connected to a water source five or six miles south of them. And from there, they brought the water into the city. It was a very expensive project. But after all, Laodicea had become the measure of how success was measured by other cities in Asia Minor. Everybody wanted to be like the city of Laodicea. And that was the problem. The church in Laodicea had become like the city. The church measured its success the way the city measured its commercial success and its financial success. But what works for the world doesn't work for the church that truly belongs to Christ. The world may call it success, but it's not success in his church. We might call it success, but Christ doesn't call it success. Don't we have the same problem today? Don't we market Christ like he's a product? A product that we want to sell? Don't we measure the success in the church like a business? In numbers? In projects completed? In things that we can see? Things that we can measure on a spreadsheet? And then we congratulate ourselves because of all the work that we've done. Just like Laodicea. Christ alone is the measure. He is the true measure by which we measure success. And as the church in Laodicea is about to find out, he doesn't see things the way that they see things. He doesn't value the things that they value. And so he addresses this church in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, and he says to the angel, to the agalos, to the leadership of the church of Laodicea, right? Christ identifies himself. He identifies himself to them as, verse 14, the Amen. Well, that's an unusual way to refer to himself, don't you think? Normally when we say Amen, we say it at the end of a prayer. But it doesn't mean the end, as some people think. It actually is a Hebrew word. It's been transliterated into Greek and into English, into a lot of other languages. It hasn't been translated. It's the same word. The meaning of the word is truly. That's what it means. When Jesus spoke in the Gospels and he said, verily, verily, or truly, truly, what he really said there was, Amen. Amen. When we say Amen, what we are saying is that what just has been spoken is true. We agree with it. We believe it. We're certain that what has just been said is reliable and is accurate. Isaiah 65, 16, God calls himself the God of truth. In Hebrew, it is the God of Amen. Christ gives the church in Laodicea a picture of himself. He is the God of the Old Testament. He is the God of the New Testament. He is the Amen, the God of truth. And he tells the church in Laodicea that all of the scriptures, all of the Old Testament scriptures, all of the teaching in the New Testament are verified in him. They are visualized in him. All of the statements, all of the promises, his work, his death, his resurrection proves that the words are true. His life demonstrates it. He is the Amen. John 10, 17 and 18, he said, I lay down my life that I may take it up again. He said, no one has taken it from me. He says, I lay it down of my own initiative. I have the authority to lay it down. 
And he says, I have the authority to take it up again. Why wouldn't we believe the words of one who has the authority to rise from the dead, who raised himself from the dead? Why wouldn't we believe his words? That's a good question. Ask somebody that sometime. Christ tells the church in Laodicea to listen to his words. These are the words of God. And because he is God, these words are reliable and they're true. He says in verse 14, he is the faithful, the pistos in Greek, the reliable and the true alethinos, the real witness, he says. Christ says that he, his words are reliable, they're accurate, they're real, they're true. Don't take these words lightly, he says to this church. Because what I'm about to say is an accurate appraisal of your condition. It is a reliable assessment. And he says, because it is true, the solution that I am going to give you is also true. He says, you can count on my word. I will honor what I say to you. That's what he says to us. He says, take me at my word. Believe what I say. He says, I am the amen. I am truth. I am the reliable and true witness. You can count on me. This isn't just any witness. What he says in verse 14, he identifies himself as the beginning of the creation of God. The arche in Greek. The origin, the source of all creation, the architect, the designer, the ruler of creation. Christ tells the church in Laodicea, it all began with me. He says, I am the creator. John 1, 3 says, all things came into being through him. Hebrews 1, 2 says, all things were made. Through him. Colossians 1.16 says all things were created through him. Despite what people say. Jesus Christ is God and he is the architect. The creator of the universe. And he is the architect of the church. And the church in Laodicea hasn't followed the plan. They haven't followed his plan for his church. This is the one who stands and addresses the church in Laodicea. And he says this to them in verse 15. He says, I know, oida, in Greek. I know, and I see the church in your city. Everyone envies you. Everyone wants to be like you. He says, but I see the truth. He says, I see your true spiritual condition. He says, I know your deeds, your ergon. He says, I know what's not there. There is no love. There is no faith. There is no perseverance. There is no sound biblical teaching. There is no commitment to Christ. So there's no persecution. Like the city. The church in Laodicea had become very accommodating. They were easy to get along with. They didn't make any waves. That would be bad for the business of the church. So Christ tells them, verse 15, you're neither cold nor hot. He reminds them of their expensive water system. The water that was piped in from five or six miles away. By the time the water reached the city, it was dirty. It smelled bad. It tasted bad. And it was warm. It was dirty, foul-smelling, foul-tasting warm water. And Christ says, that is what your church is like. Your church is like bad water. Now, ten miles southeast of Laodicea was the city of Colossae. Their water came from mountain streams. It was water that was cold, and it was pure. 
It offered refreshment and rest to the weary. Six miles north of Laodicea was the city of Hierapolis. They had hot springs. That water soothed and comforted the afflicted. It was therapeutic. It was water that offered help and healing. Christ says, you don't offer anything like that. He says, you offer neither. He said, your church is as bad as your water. He says in verse 15, I would that you were cold or hot. I wish that you were affecting people in your city for me. That people would come to be spiritually refreshed like drinking a cup of cold water. He says, I wish that you would offer them the truth of salvation, the living water, the truth of eternal life through me, the water that heals and that cleanses them of their sin, that brings wholeness and health and peace to their soul. But that wasn't the case. That wasn't the case in Laodicea. You know, some people have compared this church to the church in the United States today. And I guess from the time that Christ wrote these words, we can find churches throughout all of history that were like them. Even today. Studies have shown that over 75% of the people in this country claim that they are Christians. And they say that when they die, they will go to heaven. Matthew 7, Jesus says that it will be a shocking day when the truth comes out. It says in Matthew 7, 22 and 23, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? In your name, didn't we cast out demons? In your name, didn't we perform many miracles? And he says, I will declare to them on that day, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who... Practice lawlessness. They went to church. They read the Bible. They sang the songs. They listened to the sermons. They claimed to know Christ. They even worked for Him. But like the church in Laodicea, they lived in a way, and according to the wisdom of the world, they were poisoned by the wisdom of the thinking of the world. And so Christ tells this church in Laodicea, verse 15 into 16, because you are lukewarm, because what you do is useless and is dishonoring to me, you're neither hot or cold, he says. Because what you do doesn't bring me glory, doesn't bring me honor, your idea of a relationship is superficial. It's phony. He says, because of that, verse 16, he says, I'll spit you out of my mouth. I'm hail in Greek. To vomit. Like bad water. The church in Laodicea made Christ sick to his stomach. That's a sobering warning of judgment for this church. If this church doesn't listen to the words of the one whose words are true, he says he'll spit them out of his mouth. You know, today, we speak of judgment. That's a word that people don't like to hear, do they? It speaks of accountability to Christ. People don't want to hear about accountability. They don't like those words. People don't even take those words seriously. Even within the church. Who really listens to these words of Christ? 1 Peter 4.17 says it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And I believe it is time. Even within the church, people are unwilling to take an honest look at themselves and to see themselves the way Christ sees them. That was the problem in Laodicea, wasn't it? So how did they see themselves? How did the church in Laodicea see itself? Verse 17, he says, you say... I'm rich. I become wealthy. Same word, same basic word in Greek, plautos. He says, you say that we are overflowing with abundance and we have need of nothing. 
Says you claim to be blessed by God. You claim you have everything you need. You think your financial success means that you are spiritually blessed. He says you're fooling yourselves. He says you're rich. Yeah, rich in pride. He says you say you're full. He says yeah, you're full of yourselves. Christ says you don't see. You don't understand your true spiritual condition. Verse 17, he says, You do not know that you are wretched. Taleporos. That you are not thinking clearly. That's what the word means. That you are senseless, without understanding. He says, You do not see, verse 17, that you are miserable. Eleinos. That you are to be pitied. Not envied. He said, you are to be pitied. And why? He says, because you don't see, verse 17, that you are tokos, poor. That you are really beggars. Forget about your bank account, he says. You have no spiritual resources to draw from. Your money can't help you now. He says, you don't have the riches that are most important, that are essential, that are crucial. He said, you don't have the riches of a spiritual relationship, the spiritual blessing that comes from a true relationship with Christ. He says, you don't see this. You don't understand it. Why? He says, verse 17, because you're blind. Truthless. You have no sight. You're spiritually blind. You can't see. You're walking around in the dark. You're stumbling around. You just don't get it, he says. You don't see it. He says, you don't see, verse 17, that you are naked. Gumnos, stripped naked. You don't see, he says, that you have nothing. You have nothing of eternal value. He says, all you have is the shame of your nakedness and the shame of your sin. Wow. How many people go to church? How many people are religious and claim to know Christ? They name the name of Christ, but they don't see that they don't have a real relationship with Him. Still, our Lord who is long-suffering, who is gracious, reaches out to these people. Verse 18. He says to them, I advise you. He says, I, I counsel you. I give you this instruction. Here's the way to get back to me. Can the church afford to ignore this command of Christ? Can we? He instructs them, verse 18, buy from me gold. Not the gold from your financial institutions, not that kind of gold. He says gold that you can only get from me. He said this is gold, verse 18, refined by fire. Poor all. This is white, hot. This has been heated in the furnace. All the impurities have been burned away. What is this gold? Well, our salvation is free, isn't it? We can't buy it. It's been given to us without cost. Without cost to us. It's what we receive from Christ. But he's paid for it. Paid for it in his blood. Peter said in 1 Peter 1.7, It is precious. He says, your salvation is precious. It is more precious than gold. But then he went on to say, the proof of your faith, the proof that you truly have salvation, that you know Christ, is this. He says, it will be seen in your tribulations. It will be seen in your difficulties as you seek to live for him. He says, you will be tested by fire. And what will happen, he says, it will burn off the dross. The suffering will refine you. It'll make us more like Christ. That was what was missing. That was what was missing from Laodicea. They had no suffering. So they were just the same as they were. They were not becoming more like Christ. They didn't even know him. And Peter says, in the end, those who belong to him 
will bring forth praise and glory and honor to him. Ah, that's what Christ is looking for from the church in Laodicea. A true relationship, a real relationship that in the end brings praise and honor and glory to him. He says in verse 18, then, he says, you will be rich. Then you will have true riches. No more playing church. No more phoniness. No more self-righteousness. He says, instead, you will have the riches of a real relationship. A relationship with the God of creation. But even for a church like Laodicea, it's not too late. It's not too late to come to Christ. That the grace of our Lord. The city was known for black wool garments. Instead, Christ offers them, verse 18, white garments. He says that you may clothe yourselves and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. What does it say in Isaiah 61.10? We are clothed with the garments of salvation. It says we are wrapped in the robe of his righteousness, clothed in the purity and the holiness and the righteousness of Christ. That's what Christ offers the church in Laodicea. That's what he offers them. The city of Laodicea was known for its eye treatments. Yet the church was spiritually blind. So Christ offers to open up their eyes. Acts 26.18 says, To open up their eyes that they might see. That they might turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan. He says, I offer you, verse 18, I salve. He says, healing, help. He says, to open up your eyes that you might see the truth. Anyone who asks Christ to open up their eyes will have their eyes opened. The church in Laodicea thought they had everything. Christ said, you have nothing. Those whom I love, he said in verse 19, he said, I reprove, I expose their sin. He says, and I discipline them. I train them. I educate them. I punish them. So he says, be zealous therefore. Zaluo. Boil over with the fervent desire. And the resolve. He says, to repent. Matanoeo. To turn away from sin. To turn your heart and your mind and your direction to Christ. Was there anyone? Anyone in that church? Anyone in the church of Laodicea who heard the voice of Christ? Anyone willing to respond to him? Verse 20. Christ said, Behold, I call out to you, each one of you, he says in verse 20, I stand at the door. Christ is standing at the door of the church. He's not even inside. Revelation 1, we saw him standing in the midst of his church. Revelation 2, we saw him walking among his church. Have they gone that far away? That now he stands outside of the church? How many churches today does he stand outside of? How many? He says, verse 20, I stand and I knock. Cruel. I continually knock. Continually strike. Continually bang on the door. He says, if anyone, anyone hears my voice and opens the door, here's what will happen. He says, if anyone is willing to turn from their sin, he says, if, if there's anyone who hungers and thirsts for a relationship, a real relationship with me, if anyone there will seek me with their whole heart, he says, that person will find me. Christ says, verse 20, I will come to him. I will dine with him. And he with me, he says, we will be together. He says, we'll dine together. 
Dipnon in Greek, supper. He says, we will have supper together. It's the last meal of the day. It's the time when people got together and they enjoyed each other's company. And there was fellowship. There was sharing. There was communion. It's the promise of a real relationship with Christ. If anyone in the church of Laodicea wants a real relationship with their creator, Christ says, you can have it. Remember, it was the last meal of the day. The last meal before nighttime. The last meal before it became dark. The last opportunity for fellowship. The last opportunity for a relationship with Christ before it's too late. This is a promise, but this is also a warning. Time is running out for the church in Laodicea. So Christ says in verse 21, He who overcomes, he who knows me, he who obeys me, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne as I overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. It's a promise. It's a promise not only of a relationship with Christ, not only a fellowship with Him, but it's a promise we'll rule with Him, we'll share in His kingdom. How do we get there? Well, the way to get there, according to verse 21, is the same way that Christ got there. Right? It says He overcame. So how did He overcome? By way of the cross, right? Isn't how he overcame? Hebrews 12.2 says he endured the cross, despising the shame, and then what happened? He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's how he got there. He overcame by way of the cross. Believers overcome the same way, by way of the cross. There is no other way. Revelation 12.11 says this of our brothers and sisters in the future. It says, They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and because of their testimony, and they did not love their life even unto death. That's how they overcame. They were true believers, true overcomers. That's not the message that the church wants to hear today. We want to reign, yes. We want to reign with Christ. But not by way of the cross. But that's the only way to get there. Christ said that's the only way to get there. If you are willing to follow him despite the circumstances, despite the consequences, that is the way of the cross. That was the message to the church at Laodicea. That is what Christ offered them. And that is the message for the church today. No wonder it's such a narrow way. To them. To us. To all who hear his words. Christ says in verse 22, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is a message for us. The Laodiceans have already made their decision either way. It is the church today that needs to make that decision for Christ. You've been listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Borean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.